Talking about the actual UTA, I would now like to talk about Uruguay's national team since they're going to be in Qatar in, in November, but the past the World Cup rather looked like a, a, a difficult road, at least until the sacking of legendary head coach uh, El Maestro, Oscar Tavares. Yes. Because he, he had done he had done a, a good job since his arrival in 2006, especially by helping the, with the youth development, oh. right? Absolutely. So what made him so sh- special? A lot of people were against his sacking despite the poor performances of his team. What made him so special? Well, oh, wow. Okay. If I were to go from the absolute beginning, I remember reading. So he shows up and he announces his project. And I remember like my eyes were glowing because, you know, you, you have a new manager. Usually they, they'll promise the world, but this seemed more interesting than promising the world. Like what he talked about was actually something. So Tavares essentially showed up and he referenced a book that he wrote around 1990 in the 90s called Uruguay Never Again World Champion. And it had a question mark like Uruguay Never Again World Champion. And I just talked about the book, talked about the economic realities, population, TV deals. It just said it's impossible. You know, he even described that he, I think it was like a polar some guy in football said that Uruguay is just to, in Europe, Uruguay seen as the mouse in the library, that one that took over the library, basically, like incredibly. But he said it's, it just it was such a miracle. Like he says, it, you know, it's very unlikely to happen because of everything, population, you know. It's almost like, you know, the amount of players you produce in a country of 200 X million, which is Brazil, as opposed to Uruguay, it's just, you, know, you can't even, you know, Brazil produces what Uruguay produces, one type of Brazil will have 15, basically, right? So one of the things Tavares uh, figured was, okay, how can we take advantage of this idea that Uruguay, you know, can't depend on the local league anymore to produce the players? So he decided to base everything on the youth system. And what he did was, he created a system where every generation or every, let's just say under 14, 15, 16, whatever, they all play the same way. So there's the same style. So that would facilitate the transition into the national team. Okay, and that's fine. But the other thing was this. He said he wanted to train all the youth players to give them basically the tools they needed to succeed in Europe. And then, ha- and then when they go to Europe, they would be filled in with the rest of whatever they needed for their development. So it was a very interesting thing because he was breeding players that, essentially would have an advantage over other South American players to get spots in Europe before them. It's very, very interesting the way he, he did that. And basically, you know, he, he changed everything in terms of the mentality. So, for example, he started giving the youth players language classes in English, in French, and other languages because he wanted them to go to Europe now and know what it's like to acclimatize yourself, to be in a different culture. So there was cultural training, language training. Now, this might seem like the norm, but at the time, it was kind of ahead of its time. It was not even practiced. You would hear about Uruguayan players going to France and then getting drunk and coming back, you know, after getting fired by the club after a few months. And, you know, he wanted to change all that in general so you know one of the things was was that in terms of the the youth promotion the development of the youth system there was a lot more influence put into it and i mean luckily for Uruguay, at least the results were almost immediate which is kind of surprising to be honest i did not expect the results to, to come immediately in the youth system so in 2017 19 sorry 2011 uruguay went to the under 17 world cup final lost to mexico the host at the azteca mm-hmm. 2-1 barely on 2013, they go to the under-20 World Cup final, losing penalties to France with Pogba and everything, and played amazing. 2015, they win the Pan American Games, beating the world champion gold medalist Mexico, the full 11 team. I, I was in Toronto for that. I went to that game. Mm. Yeah. And they almost won the under-20 World Cup with Valverde. Like in 2000, I think it was 18 or 19, they lost in penalties to Venezuela in an incredible match that like, I think they could have won it had they won to the final. So I'm just saying like immediately, like right away, it brought somehow, you know, a lot of success. So, you know, okay, that's from the youth perspective. Now into the the national team, there was a lot of soul searching with Tavares. Um, Essentially, you know, Tavares changes philosophy multiple times in his career. So one of the biggest moments for Tavares, and this is is actually funny enough, it's mentioned by Tim Vickery, that British uh, journalist that I mentioned before. One of the biggest games for Uruguay was the opening of the 2007 Copa America. So Uruguay was thumped 3-0 by Peru. And Uruguay thought they did a really excellent preparation. They had had friendlies. They played really well. 
well. They even beat European opponents in the friendly. So they were going into the Copa America thinking, oh, yeah, we're, we have a really good team. We're going to do well. And Peru thumps them. Suddenly, Tavares had this massive sort of emotional, philosophical change in the press and everything. He's like, no, no, no. Uruguay's a defensive team. Now I know. It's like we, we've remembered now. When we won World Cups and everything, we were never like Brazil or Argentina, dominating, giving up space. No, no, no. We have to defend first which I thought was very interesting because he had the same conclusion in the 1990 World Cup. So he, Uruguay gets pumped by Belgium 3-1. Suddenly he decides, no, 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 Uruguay's a defensive team. And, you know, he played the rest of the World Cup that way. So I thought it was interesting. And well, the, the luck is that Uruguay had results go their way because Tabarro was about to get fired multiple times. <laughs> there was a time when Uruguay lost 4-0 to Brazil at the Centenario and Tabarro was like on his last leg. Um, it ended up in 2009 that Uruguay had to win an incredible run of games. So it's kind of funny because Uruguay had to do this the last few World Cups as well to even make the playoff to play Costa Rica. So they had to beat Ecuador and Quito, which was impossible, and they did it. You know, so there's a lot of results that they did, and Tavares was very lucky, I think, in that sense. But like I said, the players responded well to him. He was always a very... Um, very educational coach in that sense. You know, like I said, he always wanted to teach respect over all that the idea of the Garracharrua, the old, violent, negative idea should be removed. The players were very, very, very happy about this. They were very positive. They responded to it. You know, um, again, I, it's funny because I mentioned Tim Vickery a lot, but once Tim Vickery said that in the 80s, Uruguay played like the World Cup was their birthright. Because I don't know if you know this, but have you heard of Uruguay's 1986 team? Because it's a very violent uh, World Cup that they played. I'm not sure if you heard um, of that. Uh, I have to admit. Have well, to admit. The 86 team is insane. Like Uruguay was like, oh my God. It's considered one of, against Denmark, they had a, world, a red card. Then they had the fastest red card in history against Scotland. And then against Argentina, they kicked Argentina off the pitch in the round of 16. But the team was very, very violent. And like I said, in response to this, Tim Vickery said that they played as if, you know, you taking the World Cup from them or eliminating them was like you you took away their birthright. Like they feel so connected with football. So Tavares basically changed a lot of this from the mentality aspect. But like I said, the results did help. You know, Suarez's hand against Ghana. I mean, <laughs> there's little mo <laughs> there's like there's actually incredible moments that you're thinking like, you know, if Suarez wasn't here, what would have happened to Tavares really, right? You mm -hmm. know. Like against Korea, you know, Uruguay's on the verge of getting eliminated. And Suarez does this incredible, in a thunderstorm, like curling shot from like, you know, 30 meters, top, like, you know, top corner. I mean, wow. You know, so <laughs> I'm just thinking, um, you know, if I were to, if I was to be a manager, I would definitely want someone like Suarez saving me, uh, you know. But like I said, Tabarez has gotten Uruguay playing consistently. And, you know, I'm reading my notes here, but, um, you know, it's just, yeah, it's just, you know, as the results follow, the team grew in strength. And in a way, Tabaras grew in strength as well. His political leverage grew as well. So after 2010, he was untouchable. Then he won the Copa America. It's like, forget it. Like, I think Uruguay could have been eliminated from 2014. and He still would have had the choice to resign or not. Um, in 2014, he was not blamed for the elimination. You know, according to everyone, we, we beat Italy, England. Suarez bit Chiellini. Oh God, that changed everything. Then what happens? 2018 has a phenomenal campaign. They come in second. They go all the way to the quarterfinals against Portugal. By that point, no one wanted him to leave. All they see is Tabarez promoting the right players. They seem consistently getting the decisions right. So, you know, at, at one point it got to the point where you know, people thought, wow, Tabarez is just, you know, he, he gets it. He, he can do no wrong. But eventually um, this qualifier happened. And well, the thing was, Uruguay was struggling throughout, and even the games they won, it was not very convincing. That's the thing. And like, for example, Uruguay won an injury time against Chile, and Chile dominated the match. Uruguay had like a random shot went in um, against Ecuador. Injury time against Ecuador. I didn't think Uruguay played well at all. I think they created one chance the whole match. So, you know, those are six key points that could have changed the entire qualifier. But then what happened was, as you know, you probably know, and I think it was promoted, you know, in South America, it was very promoted um, and publicized, is that Uruguay played terrible over the last four or five matches. They tied Colombia at home, did not really do well in that match. Colombia could have won it easily, actually, at one point. They were humiliated by Brazil and Argentina. And I'm not talking humiliated like, you know, they left their souls on the pitch. Like, the team stopped running. They were, like, absolutely outplayed. They looked, like, without a spirit. Like, it did not look like Uruguay. I had never seen Uruguay do that. Just give up. So, I don't know. There was a lot of... Uh, 
I don't know, the, the people were very emotional about this decision. He's like a father figure almost to Uruguayans, to the Uruguayan football for the last six, what, 15, 16 years. Um, but again, the, the fear came. And when it came down to it, the new administration, you know, a lot of players criticized that the administration didn't have the experience of dealing with pressure. And as soon as they saw the opportunity, they thought less, you know, we can't go down with the ship. We can't go down with Tamara's. So, you know, when it did happen, some people were against it. A lot of the players, especially, were very vocal that Tabara should have not been just fired. Like they should have left him for the last four games. You know, one one of the biggest changes with Tabara is um, I'm not sure if it's your upcoming question, but with Diego Alonso, um, actually, I didn't want to get ahead of myself. Did you want to transition that into Diego Alonso? Um, yeah, sort of. Uh, I just want okay. to to say that maybe a reason for uh, Tabara's decline was also that he. He was suffering. He's still suffering from from um, from a new row. Um, I don't know, but from from a disease. Uh, yes, a new row disease. I think so. That 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 could have, have played a, a role as well. But uh, well, now you now you talked about uh, new coach Diego Alonso. So the the games you mentioned again, Chile and Colombia and the others uh, was the. Was Diego Alonso already uh, at the head of, of the team or all not? So Alonso came in. His first match was actually against uh, Paraguay in Asuncion. So his four games were Paraguay in Asuncion, which they won. Then they won in Venezuela, 4-1. Then they beat Peru. That was the key one. And then and Chile uh, away. So Colombia, no. That was that was still tomorrow's when they tied 1-1 against Colombia. Yeah. And they, they went ahead. Uh, ahead Ecuador, who was long uh, sur- uh, third in in the qualifying rounds, but yes, surprisingly, do, is so. Do do Uruguay play better now under under new coach Diego Alonso, or was it, uh, <laughs> uh, or did they have a, a bit of, of luck, uh, or were they lucky with with the results? It's we know that yeah, we know results can be sometimes misleading, you know. Absolutely. That's the thing. And yeah, there's a saying in Uruguay, it's like with, with in retrospect, um, but they say, you know, with Monday's newspaper, that's what they say in Uruguay often. It's like, oh, it's easy to talk now, with, now that you have Monday's newspaper, right? Like, you know what happened. But the idea is that a lot of people, especially the ones who were against Tabaras, they were thrilled because it wasn't just the way Uruguay won, or sorry, it wasn't how that Uruguay won, is the way they did. And they were very surprisingly dominant. There was another energy to the team. The thing is, Diego Alonso, Diego Alonso comes from that generation of players. So he played like in the league when you know when Cavani was there. He was in Peñarol. Um, he knows the players, and right off the bat, he he basically got a lot of fans on his side because he immediately called up all of the players that Tavares never really trusted in the national team. So a lot of people for years were asking for Matias Oliveira. They were asking for, well, Belisti was a really huge surprise and he was wonderful internationally. So there's a, there's a few players that, like I said, he, he, he called up Sergio Rochet, the Nacional from Uruguay goalkeeper. You know, Muslera was Tavares' boy, like basically he's his guy right for the last, what, four campaigns, basically. So, you know, um, it's, it's interesting that what I noticed, at least if you're asked from my perspective, I noticed Uruguay was ultra offensive and it was just very strange seeing that because I did not see that at all with Tabares over the last, you know, four qualifiers, basically, or four campaigns. So eventually, essentially ultra attacking, Europe was pushing everyone forward, like random attacks. And you have uh, Ronald Araujo from Barcelona making deep runs like up. And it was just really interesting because, you know, in corners, um, I would see with Tabares, you're going to have three guys up. Suddenly you had eight or nine in the box. And Uruguay just ready for the counter. They're, they were not speculating anymore. What I noticed was that he gave a lot of freedom to two players that needed it. And that was Bentancur and Valverde. So Valverde of Real Madrid, Bentancur of, of Tottenham. Mm-hmm. Valverde and Bentancur, if you saw Uruguay the way they played before, they almost seem unrecognizable. They're playing like a very, and I'm saying this as a layman, obviously I don't work in professional football, but they seemed almost like drawn back, like as if they were tactically limited in a sense. But now it's almost as if they've given free reign to do what you want, express yourselves, go forward, attack. And yeah, I, I just noticed a massive difference in the attitude of the players. Um, you have Araujo obviously playing defend, Bendancur, Oliveira, Pelistri. 
so everything he's done, uh, Alonso has been has been good. But again, like you said, we might be in the honeymoon phase. And Uruguay has never gone down one match. And I've, I'm always interested to see how a team responds if they concede, honestly, to see the real quality of the team. I think it's very easy if you score first and do it over and over. But again, like I said, um, you know, defenders of Tabarez will say that a lot of players were injured. So even during that straight, like literally he had the worst. It's like, okay, Tabarez, go prove yourself. Oh, who are we playing? Uh, Argentina away, Brazil away, and Bolivia away. Good luck. You know what I mean? It's like, I think... Honestly, like, like Germany would probably lose all three of those matches. I think I play in La Paz, it's very difficult. So I'm just saying Tabarez, and he had a lot of injuries. I think Suarez even played like at 50% capacity. So I don't know. I, I want to give Tabarez the benefit of the doubt. I love Tabarez. I've always supported him. Um, so I'm just, I'm trying to point out both sides of the thing. You know what I mean? That the Alonso, so lucky for him, he had everyone fully fit. Everyone was fit and, and firing at all cylinders. So he even got the best out of Georgian de Racaeta, who was never, he never really did much with Tavares. And suddenly he's been incredible, like three games in a row. Like I thought, you know, world class. Hmm. But I go. heard he, he plays well uh, at Flamengo. So maybe yeah. that that's that liberty that that uh, Alonso gave uh, Bentancur and yes. Valverde. Is is maybe the what what Uruguay needed and wanted to to ask a uh, last question um, yeah. on the on the Celeste for the World Cup. Uh, who are the young players we we have to keep an eye on? So we all re- we all already know Araujo, uh, Vinia, Rodrigo Dancur and Federico Valverde, as well as Darwin Nunez, because they all play in a big European club. But yeah. Yeah. Um, and they are essentially yeah, um, midfielders and 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 defenders. So is maybe Facundo Pellistri or Facundo Torres the the new face uh, of um, what may be what may be the new face of La Celeste in in um, in Qatar? Um, it could. So you're talking about just mostly the, the list of 23, not just the starting lineup, right? So you're saying in general, like just to get called up, right? So, well, yeah, I mean, obviously Vigna will probably get called up. He, he kind of, you know, Vigna of Roma, he lost his starting lineup space, I think, recently uh, to uh, Matias Oliveira. But, you know, he's, I think, definitely going to be called up. Um, in terms of younger players, well, you know, you have uh, Satriano. He plays in Brest in France, in Ligue 1. He's doing very well. For actually. me, sir. He's, yeah, he's, on, yeah. he's on loan from, from Inter, right? Yeah, he has like five goals in eight, in eight appearances. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've eight heard nine. of him. Never he's saw him, but... Um, he, I think he's only like 21 years old or even, if even 20 actually. And he has a good build to him. So, you know, he, he was actually called up to the pre, uh, the pre list, right. Before they called up the final 23 for the last qualifiers, he was called up, uh, Satriano. So he definitely would have a shot. Um, I would say another one would be, uh, Rodrigo Salazar, who's, he's actually Spanish, but he, he decided to play for Uruguay. He plays in Schalke and he's been phenomenal. He's actually been like one of their stars taken into first division. So they're in first place now in Bundesliga two. And he actually, incredibly, he went up with another team. I think it was Hamburg. And then he was sold to Schalke. Schalke actually bought him as like the future project because they thought we're going to go up and we're going to want you on the team. So he went from the Bundesliga back to second division just to be on a, on a giant called Schalke. And now he's been tremendous. They're in first place, like favorites to win Bundesliga too. Okay. And he's, he's only 21. And his father was a was a was like a big Uruguayan player in the, in the 70s and 80s. Mm-hmm. So... Like I said, like it's, you know, even in, I find even players who are not raised in Uruguay, if you have any Uruguayan connection, it's very difficult for them to turn down. I find, um, you know, even recently, uh, Sebastian Abreu's son, um, who's absolutely Mexican, like speaks with a Mexican accent, born and raised. Um, and he plays with the Mexico's under 20, under 17. He chose to play for Uruguay recently. He just yeah. said, he he that's just, surprising he just, when you're the son of Loco Abreu. <laughs> that's the thing as well, true. Yeah. But he was like very, like very, very proud of being Mexican too. And he's just said he, in football, he just, he leaned a little more. But you're right, as being the son of Abreu, it's impossible, I think, to resist, honestly. But, but um, uh, in the starting 11, who, who do you see uh, have a, ch- uh, who do you think has a change of, uh, of entering the, the lineup? Because well, Cavani, Suarez are, are up front with with Nunez. Maybe maybe wingers. Uh, I think maybe Nicolas de la Cruz or. Oh yeah, the same as well. Yes, he, he might he might start or uh, or Facundo Torres or or Pelistri. I, I think 
these they might be a good a good um, good surprise uh, if I mean, uh, so, so to say because we they don't have uh, any experience in in major tournaments and that would that will really be uh, like the the next the next step for them yeah and absolutely actually, Absolutely. Well, you know, the thing is, you never know. I find I'm always surprised with the players. Like if I were to, like if I were to right now, if you were to show me the starting lineup in 2026, you know, let's just say the qualifiers at the end, I might be like, who is this guy? Like there are players sometimes that appear and I'm like, I can't, I never predicted this guy was going to make it or even appear. So I remember the last World Cup, you had um, Guillermo Varela, who now plays in, uh, do you, wait, uh, where is he? he's in Russia, I believe. He, he's like a right back. He used to play for Piano at the time. I never thought he, like he he was even part of the qualifiers, and suddenly he starts against Egypt. Okay, Torreira was not even part of the qualifiers at all. He just was brought into the World Cup late. He was playing for Fiorentina. I think he was just sold to Arsenal or about to be sold, and suddenly he appeared. So sometimes you never know. Like Torreira was known. Oh yeah, yeah. There's a good player in Fiorentina. That's pretty much all people knew about him. But then again, he eventually won his place in the starting lineup. He started against, you know, Russia, Portugal, France. Um, in, in terms of, if I were to say Uruguay now, I would, the, the you know, the, the 11 would be probably Rochette, the national goalkeeper. Um, he's, you know, he's been excellent form-wise and in, also in club level, Copa Libertadores and internationally. Although I, I know we have the whole incident with the ball being caught. I don't know if you saw that. The ball was caught in, uh, against Peru. It became like a meme worldwide. I don't know if you heard about that. No, I didn't see that. Thing. So the last play, like 94th minute, like ah, just yeah, shot, yeah, yeah. And, it, and the wind blows it and Russia just yeah. catches it in the net with like five seconds. Very controversial. Oh, it was insane. I almost like <laughs> had a heart attack. Imagine we're about to go to the World Cup <laughs> and that happens. But anyways, other than that, which could be hilarious that that actually might be the, the moment that makes his career go next level. But so I would say, um, you know, Josema, injuries could stop him he should start at Aujo probably Godin if he can make it obviously he's a little old he's like 35 36 um left back should probably would be Matias Oliveira and then the middle would be Betancur Valverde and De Racaeta I think would he's definitely earned it and the other one would be Pelistri in terms of players who have earned it you know they've consistently played very well in the last five games so the forwards would naturally be Suarez and Darwin Nunez I think um unless one of Suarez is unhealthy maybe Cavani could uh, who knows but I don't know Suarez and Cavani are that interchangeable they're very different players and I don't know if Cavani would benefit Darwin Nunez more than Suarez they, they did play together once um or twice um you know so I'm, I'm just saying I'm I'm not sure but like I said the idea I think now is that what we just saw in the qualifiers would essentially be Uruguay's uh Serie Lano with Darakaeta Belicia on the wings Suarez and Darwin uh at the front so that that seems to be at least but Again, like I said, you never know. You never know who might come up. Yeah. So, so, never know. So, Varo, thank you very much for your time and the quality of your insights on Uruguay in football. I, I can't re recommend you in, enough, guys, to, to go and follow him on Twitter and on YouTube. But you can also follow me as well to make sure you don't miss any similar content. And if you like the video, please drop me a like and let me know about it in the comment section. Tell me a lot more than you think. Bye-bye. Thank you, Maxime. Uh